Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate us, uh, your invitation to have us here. So as the first speaker here in this next session on the California Rapid Assessment Method, of, or CRAM, my job is to give you guys an introduction to CRAM, a crash course, if you will. But based upon that last question, it sounds like you guys are already well in the know. So this will be a quick refresher so that you have all the tools at your fingertips to really dive into the content of the next two presentations. So you guys are all familiar with CRAM, but you might uh, need a quick little refresher here. What exactly is CRAM? Well, it's a field-based walk and talk diagnostic tool. And it provides rapid, repeatable, and numeric assessment of the overall condition of a wetland. Now it does this based upon visible indicators of the form, structure, and setting of that wetland. Again, all relative to the least impacted reference condition. So I said overall condition. Well, that's the capacity or the potential of that wetland to provide the entire suite of functions and services that we expect from that wetland type in its natural setting. Again, relative to the best reference condition. So how exactly do you conduct a CRAM assessment? Well, it takes um, a team of two to three trained practitioners less than three hours out in the field, start to finish. And of course, that time is going to be dependent upon what type of wetland you're looking at, how big that wetland is, and how complex. So the field practitioners go on out into the field with their data sheets and their appropriate scale air photos. And first thing they do is define the assessment area, or the AA. That's actually the footprint on the ground that the assessment takes place in. Next, they walk the AA area multiple times, they make their observations, they make their measurements, and then they complete the scoring on those data sheets. Then after they leave the field, they go on back into the office and enter that data into cramwetlands.org. Okay, assessment area. Like I said, it's really the footprint on the ground, the area that the assessment pertains to. Sometimes you might have a really small wetland, and so your AA might be inclusive of that entire wetland. But more often than not, the AA is really just a smaller portion of a much larger wetland. For instance, think about a stream channel, where your AA might just be a small reach within a much longer stream course. Now establishing a proper AA is really a critical step in CRAM because using an incorrect AA can yield results that are not reproducible or may not relate to those um, stressors or the management actions that are acting upon that wetland. So CRAM has been developed to pertain to all wetlands in California. And we built CRAM so that it uh, is built upon a series of modules. That is, a module for each wetland type. So for example, we have riverine wetlands, um, including episodic ephemeral channels. We have depressional wetlands, ponds, um, seasonal wetlands, vernal pools, estuarine wetlands, including salt marshes and bar-built lagoons, and slope wetlands. So our wet meadows, seeps and springs, and our forested slopes. Now we all know that the processes that are driving each of these wetlands are all very different. And so therefore, the assessment areas for each of these wetland types are also going to be different. For example, in the riverine module, your assessment area is going to represent a length of channel that's about 100 to 200 meters long. And then laterally, it's going to include your channel, your active floodplain, and a portion of the adjacent riparian area. So in a small channel, a small creek channel, you might end up with an assessment area that looks something like this. Okay, now that we know a little bit about the assessment area, that area on the ground, now let's dive into how CRAM is actually built. 
So CRAM measures the overall wetland condition, and it does that by looking at four attributes of condition. The buffer and landscape context, hydrology, physical structure, and biotic structure. And these four attributes are universal across all of the different CRAM modules. And under each attribute, there's a number of metrics, two to three metrics, and sometimes there's even submetrics. For example, in buffer and landscape context, um, here we have two metrics, the aquatic area abundance and buffer. And then buffer has submetrics. So on the ground, we're actually looking at things like the percent of the assessment area that has buffer, or the average buffer width, or the buffer condition. Now these metrics and submetrics are the things that the practitioners out in the field are actually asked to score. And so CRAM has, is built with four mutually exclusive alternative states for every metric. And together, these four states represent the full range of possible condition. So here in this example, I'm showing average buffer width. You can see that the practitioner would, out in the field, measure that average buffer width, and the um, score, or they, the value that they get, would fall into one of these four bins. Now, CRAM scores using an alphabetic score, A, B, C, or D. And we do this because we've all been in school, and I'm positive that all of us in this room were all A students. We all want to get an A. But CRAM is trying to create a numeric score, and so we need to translate those alphabetic scores into numeric scores. We do this here in a series of rating tables for each of the individual metrics. Now sometimes these metrics can be very quantitative, like this one, average buffer width. But sometimes the metrics are a little more qualitative. And so for instance here in the riverine module, we have a metric called channel stability. And here the practitioners are guided through a worksheet where they are talking about um, if the channel is in equilibrium or if it's showing signs of aggradation or degradation. And obviously those lower scores would be more severe aggradation or degradation. So you can see on the surface, the CRAM metrics seem very, very simple, but actually they are, they are integrating many complex ecological processes and functions. For example, there's another metric called vertical biotic structure. And here, the practitioner is asked to take a look at how many overlapping plant layers exist within the assessment area. Pretty simple, right? Well, it actually is capturing many complex processes, things like the vertical habitat structure for bird use in that area, the gradients of light and temperature, rainfall interception, cover for wildlife, and even filtration of floodwaters. And this is true for every metric. All right, so now that I've given you just a little bit of flavor of what each of the metrics are actually all about, let's take a closer look at some of the scoring. So like I said, practitioners out in the field are actually scoring individual metrics. Once they do that, those metric scores roll up to create the attribute score. And that attribute score is scored based upon the potential possible points. So in this example here, biotic structure attribute gets a 75. We do that for all four of the attributes. And then those four attributes roll up to create the overall wetland condition score, or the index score. Now, that index score is very handy. It's easy to take a quick look at that and get a rough feel for how that wetland is doing, what the health or the condition of that wetland actually is. But we really emphasize that you have to drill down. You have to drill down to those attribute scores or sometimes even the metric scores to really understand what is actually going on in that wetland. For example, here's the salt marsh up in Humboldt County. It got an index score of 70. 
and it did so by getting fairly low buffer and landscape and hydrology scores, but then higher physical and biotic structure scores. Now, just down the road is another marsh, and it got an index score of 72, almost essentially the same score, but it did so completely opposite. It got high buffer and landscape and hydrology scores, and then lower physical and biotic structure scores. So it's very important to drill down into the CRAM score to understand what's going on. So you can see, based upon that index score, as the score decreases, the wetland's capacity to provide all of the benefits that we want it to be providing is also going to decrease. That poor channel over there on the left with an index score of 44 is going to provide much fewer benefits than that creek over here that gets an index score of a 74. Now in addition to the overall condition score, CRAM also has a stressor checklist. And the point of the checklist is to help identify what might be going wrong in your, in your wetland. Why are some of those scores decreased? It also can be used for practitioners on the ground as a, a predictive tool. They can take a look at some of the stressors and think, okay, we better be watching these or we better manage these to make sure that our site condition doesn't decrease in the future. So once you're done in the field, you head on back to the office and you go to cramwetlands.org to enter your data. And CRAM Wetlands is the official um, portal for CRAM scores. Here's where you can enter your data. It, it, it stores the data for each individual practitioner. Those folks can easily retrieve their data. You can also retrieve all of the, the publicly available data. And then you can also use this website and EcoAtlas to visualize those, that data and the results. So let's say you're interested in looking at a condition for a wetland class on, let's say, a watershed scale. You can do that here. You can look at all the CRAM scores in that watershed. Or perhaps maybe you're more interested in a specific site. You can drill on down and see all the CRAM scores as they relate to project footprints on the ground. So shifting gears here just a little bit, I wanted to introduce the level one, two, three framework. Now this is a framework that the US EPA has developed and it's a really powerful tool because it classifies management questions based upon the data that you need to actually answer those questions. So in level one, this is big scale, landscape scale, map based questions, resource inventories and maps. So it might represent questions like, how many acres of wetland do I have? What type of wetlands do I have? Um, maybe even what's the patch size distance in between those wetlands? Now level two is rapid field-based assessment of overall wetland function or condition. So for example, maybe HGM or CRAM. And then level three are those really intensive assessments of specific processes or functions. So this is the stuff that us as scientists like to do. Let's say benthic macroinvertebrates or bird counts or vegetation plots. All of those really fine detailed things. Now each of these three levels work together. It truly is a framework. You need all three levels. And we're probably already doing all of this in our everyday projects. So for example, you need level one, that map of where the wetlands are, to produce the sample frame. It tells us where on the landscape we need to go in order to do our level two assessments. And then we need level three. It validates the results that we're getting in level two. Now in the next two talks, Kara is going to provide some examples of how level three has been used to validate level two. And then Cliff will give us a little bit better idea of the linkages between level one and level two. Just as a quick teaser, here's a little bit of calibration data. So this is between CRAM index scores on the x-axis and then benthic IBI scores on the y-axis. And so you can see there's a significant positive relationship in between the two. As CRAM scores go up, the IBI scores also go up. 
So I want to leave you today with the idea that CRAM can be a very powerful monitoring and assessment tool. And I want to emphasize that it's really one tool of many in the toolbox. And it's intended to complement rather than replace level one and level three data. We really need all three levels working together to get a good idea of what is the um, overall condition and how are our wetlands functioning. Now CRAM can be used in ambient settings. If you're interested in knowing the overall condition of a suite of wetlands, um, let's say on a watershed scale, but it also can be very powerful in looking at project settings. So perhaps you want to know the overall condition within a project footprint or an area of projects. And finally, CRAM is very well suited for quantifying condition at a site through time. So think about repeat monitoring um, after a restoration or a mitigation project. But it's also very well suited for comparing sites of the same wetland type within a reason, region and across regions. So it gets both that spatial and that temporal comparison. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Very good. You guys are letting me off the hook. Uh oh. One quick question. So when you say projects or mitigations, does that include like wholly constructed wetlands? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in CRAM, we talk about projects as um, anything that's doing an action on the ground. So it could be constructed wetlands or um, enhancements, restoration, mitigation, any of that falls within the umbrella of project. So maybe one of the next speakers will cover this, but it was interesting to see the four components, hydrology, biological, and so on. So for projects, mitigation, constructed wetlands, once they may have certain goals and want to prioritize those attributes, so can CRAM be and the other levels be modified to see if those goals are being met? Ah, we really encourage uh, folks to not be modifying CRAM. That's the power of it because it, it's very standardized. But to your question, yes, absolutely. And the interpretation of some of those scores, you know, for instance, um, you can really take a look at how the physical structure is progressing through the lifetime of your project. Or perhaps you might be doing a project where you might not have control over some of the adjacent area. And so you can interpret that through the buffer and landscape scores. Absolutely. I have a question here. Here? Over here? Yes. Oh, hi. So, um, yeah, on the hydrology kind of um, module, I'm wondering if, if CRAM is, if you've thought about incorporating um, groundwater dependence into that, groundwater dependence into the hydrologic kind of uh, module, especially given, you know, the Sigma regulations now. And it'd be really interesting to see if you could include some type of metric there for dependence of wetlands on groundwater, or if you haven't already. Right, right. Uh, that gets a little bit complicated, just because as practitioners out on the ground there for two to three hours, it's hard to really wrap your head around the groundwater situation. Um, it's not an easily visible thing like surface water actually is. But in some of the modules, for instance, in the slope wetland module, where we're looking at uh, wet meadows and other channels that are really groundwater heavily influenced, some of those metrics really do focus more on the groundwater interactions with that wetland. And one last? No, one okay. One. I was just curious, I would assume that this correlation would be the same, but have you looked at the CSCI and how that correlates with CRAM? Ah, oh, I don't have that data uh, right here at my fingertips, but on EcoAtlas, the, the umbrella that includes CRAM underneath, I know that you can pull up both the CRAM scores and the CSCI data together. Um, I don't think we've done that correlation quite yet. You know, to be honest, there is a wealth of data sitting here that we just need a few good postdocs to dive into. All right, thank you guys. Thank you.